England in the 1640s was a time of deep political and social division that erupted into a vicious civil war. While the armies of the King and Parliament battled for the future of the Kingdom, the people lived in a state of increasing anxiety and dread. No one could be sure whether their friends and neighbours were secretly for the King or for Parliament. This was also a time of growing religious fundamentalism as Puritans tried to do away with ancient traditions to impose a new and oppressive social order. And in a quiet corner of eastern England, one young man and his associates exploited this state of fear and lawlessness for their own financial gain. Travelling from village to village and town to town, he worked as a witch finder, scouring ordinary settlements to exploit the doubts and divisions of the inhabitants. In just two intense years, he rooted out and had tortured something like 300 people in just a part of eastern England. His wicked work sent up to 100 people to the gallows, more than all the other witch hunters in England over the previous century. The effects of this brutal witch hunt reverberated for years afterwards throughout England and even across the sea in the colonies of New England. So who was this evil man? Why did he start hunting witches? What did he do to find these people? And what horrors did he inflict on them with his cruel investigations? How did he get away with it for years? And what finally put an end to his campaign of terror? This is the horrifying story of the loathsome conman and fanatical witch hunter, the self-styled witchfinder general, Matthew Hopkins. Matthew Hopkins was born in about 1620 in a village called Wenham Magna in the county of Suffolk, not far from the border with the county of Essex. They were a relatively wealthy family of local gentry. His father was the vicar of St John's Church in the village, and the young Matthew would have received an intellectual and religious education. This was a time when Puritans like the Hopkins family sought to reform the Church of England by doing away with any hint of lingering Catholicism. Other Puritans wanted to be rid of the Church of England entirely, and many wanted to do away with sinful or popish social activities like performing plays, gambling and dancing, and even celebrations like Christmas. It was a time of rapid and drastic social change, driven by a certainty that the old ways were not only wrong, but dangerous, even evil. And in that way common to revolutionaries and fanatics, the sweeping changes enacted by one generation were soon condemned by those who came after them. Fervent believers in one decade could find themselves denounced and even punished by more extreme radicals in the next. Matthew Hopkins grew up in this time of religious fervour, but the details of his early life are unknown. He emerges into history as a man in his early twenties after moving to the nearby town of Manningtree in North Essex a charming place on the beautiful River Stour, where he lived as a minor gentleman. Tradition suggests he found employment as a lawyer or a lawyer's clerk in Ipswich, but there's no real evidence for that. It's likely he had enough of his family inheritance to buy a nice house, and he also purchased the Thorn Inn at Mistley, the next village to the east along the river, which would have brought him a steady income and it was in Manningtree in 1644 that Hopkins first encountered the evil practices of a group of witches. Hopkins was a man of intense religious belief in keeping with his time, as well as being dedicated to rooting out all forms of idolatry from the church and public life. Puritans could also find in the pages of their King James Bibles injunctions against witchcraft, most famously Exodus 22:18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. For some fanatics like Hopkins, the discovery, exposure and prosecution of witches became a moral quest, a crusade against the evil lurking within and corrupting society. Belief in the existence of witches was widespread amongst commoners and gentry alike. Everyone knew they existed. Indeed, the current king's father, King James I, had written on the subject in his 1597 treatise, Demonology. Witchcraft was the practice of summoning evil spirits and demons to do harm to others. Sudden ill fortune, such as the death of a child or a bad harvest or the failure of a business venture, was increasingly blamed on the malicious workings of a witch. 
In the medieval era in England, it had been the church who dealt with such matters, but from 1542, through various acts of parliament, it came to be a crime punishable by the secular authorities. The 1627 publication, A Guide to Grand Jurymen, through a combination of scientific analysis and theological understanding, helped describe the nature of witches and how they could be prosecuted under the law. Actual prosecutions, though, were relatively rare because witchcraft was a tricky thing to prove in court. However, the wonderful county of Essex, where Hopkins was living and would do much of his work, had, over the previous hundred years, staged more trials than any other and the villages around Manningtree had seen multiple witchcraft accusations in recent years, creating a growing atmosphere of paranoia and suspicion. All this clearly had a profound impact on young Matthew Hopkins. He would later write that in 1644, he started hearing the nighttime meetings of local witches near his house, their whispered conversations drifting through the darkness to his ears. Perhaps we can imagine him leaning out of an open upstairs window, straining his ears to hear this malicious talk outside. If we are to believe him, perhaps we can assume his fanaticism, fueled by reading books about witchcraft, had driven him to experience audio hallucinations. Or perhaps he made these events up to justify his involvement in the cases of the Manningtree witches. In 1645, a local widow named Elizabeth Clark was accused of witchcraft by people in Manningtree, the place Hopkins lived. Under questioning by local people, she astonishingly confessed to not only being a witch herself, but knowing of many more. A local gentleman named John Stern took a transcript of her confession to local magistrates, personal acquaintances of his, who issued him with a warrant to investigate, and Stern's friend, Matthew Hopkins, volunteered to assist him. So it was that the most savage witch hunt in English history was begun. Methods for the investigation of witches had already been established, and Hopkins and Stern now put them into practice in their own fashion. The first method was a physical examination of the naked body of the accused to look for a witch's mark. Only other women could examine the bared body of a woman, of course, and the Manningtree widow Elizabeth Clark had her naked body examined by four women of the town. They discovered that the widow had three teats, quote, in her secret parts, a sure sign that she was suckling imps in the night. The physical examination complete, Hopkins and Stern applied the second method of investigation they called watching. They held the widow under house arrest for nights on end, keeping her under sustained close observation in a single room to see if she summoned her imps, who would surely be hungry. When she was exhausted from her ordeal, Stern and Hopkins questioned the widow, demanding she give up the names of her fellow witches. Eventually, she admitted to regularly lying with the devil for years in the form of a tall, proper, black-haired gentleman. A properer man than yourself, the widow amusingly said to an outraged Hopkins. Hopkins, Stern, the four women examiners and two further townsfolk then witnessed the widow summon a series of familiars to her, strange animals with their own weird names. Hopkins later wrote all about these twisted, vile creatures. Now, in fact, the widow presumably kept a menagerie of beloved pets, dogs, cats, ferrets and rabbits and the like, in her house. But to the fanatical Hopkins and Stern, this was evidence of her pact with the devil. Eventually, the frightened, exhausted, sleep-deprived, possibly mentally ill Widow Clark began naming other impoverished and unpopular local women, and these two were arrested for questioning. In this first Hopkins case, we can already see the application of physical and psychological pressure on the accused, something he would continue and refine in the coming months and years. And by forcing them to name others, the circle of condemnation could be intentionally widened. Multiple women in Manningtree were soon arrested and sent to the jail at Colchester Castle while their legal cases were progressed. However, Hopkins knew that convictions in witchcraft cases were notoriously difficult to secure. Standards of evidence were so high that even confessions might not be enough to have the women executed. So Hopkins took it upon himself to gain access to one of the accused women in jail and persuaded her to save her own skin by offering evidence against the others, even her own mother. By now, the witch hysteria of Manningtree was spreading to nearby villages throughout the Tendring Hundred, the peninsula of Northeast Essex, 
old grievances were brought to the fore, and accusations were made against women in Thorpe Soken, Arlesford, Wivenhoe, Little Bentley, Great Clacton, Kirby Soken, St Osith, Harridge, and more. The local magistrates, going from village to village, struggled to keep up with the demand for their services, and Matthew Hopkins and John Stern volunteered to step in and investigate these cases on their behalf. These various tendering women were accused of all kinds of malicious acts by bitter and suspicious neighbours. Why on earth would they do this? Well, the puritanical worldview required all corrupting influences in society to be rooted out and destroyed. And this was a dark time in England. These people had seen rampant inflation and growing poverty, especially since the Civil War had broken out in 1642, causing the cost of food to increase dramatically while wages stayed the same. Times were hard, people were suffering, the armies of the enemy could arrive at any time and some sought to put the blame for their ill fortune on the poor, socially isolated women who often survived on charitable funding from the local parish. One rather unpleasant example from this initial witch hunt conveys the general trend. A poor widow, Margaret Moon of Thorpe Soken, had long been the subject of rumour about her behaviour. Reading about her suggests to me she was likely mentally ill, or at the least rather strange and unpleasant in her manner. The widow Moon had asked a local yeoman to exchange one of his tools for a basket of her apples. The yeoman, his wife and child subsequently fell ill and the child ultimately died. It was clear to the bereaved parents that the woman was a witch who had murdered their child with poison apples, and so they summoned the authorities. In just a few weeks, this crazed witch hunt had spread from Manningtree to every part of the Tendring Hundred, but no further. The peninsula was united geographically and socially through a series of interdependencies and social networks through which the fear and accusations spread until there were 30 women being kept in the jail at Colchester Castle awaiting prosecution. With Tendring so thoroughly scoured that there was no one left to accuse and the Colchester legal system overwhelmed with cases, Hopkins and Stern set out north across the River Stour to stalk the county of Suffolk. They would take what they had learned in Tendring on the road and turn their local witch hunting experience into a full-time and lucrative career. Hopkins and Stern would arrive in a village on horseback, perhaps taking rooms at the inn or at the homes of local gentlemen and ask the people if there were any suspected witches in the area. They would then get to work on questioning them, and by employing the two finder women that travelled with them. These were the women who would strip a suspect naked and probe her body, looking for physical evidence of witchcraft in the form of growths, especially around the genitals. They called these teats or beaks, the supposed devilish nipples, for suckling their imps or familiars, who would then be sent out to do the witch's bidding, like killing a neighbour's cow or poisoning a baby. Of course, it was hardly unusual for elderly women in the era before modern medicine to have protrusions on their body, whether skin tags, warts or cysts, or any number of lumps, bumps, birthmarks or benign congenital malformations. Suspected witches might also be subjected to the shaving of their body hair to facilitate the finding, and the shaving was also considered a spell to make a witch confess. Now, Hopkins was also very clear that if they failed to find any extra teats on a suspect's body, that did not actually prove them innocent. These finder women were also employed for the watching, the keeping of suspect witches under intense, close observation night after night to see if their imps came to them to suckle in the candlelight. Unlike in continental Europe, torture was unlawful in England, and inflicting pain and discomfort for the purposes of eliciting a confession was not allowed. However, these humiliating and uncomfortable investigations served to exhaust and dehumanise the suspects through starvation, sleep deprivation, isolation, surveillance and intimidation, and many surely confessed just to end the intense pressure of their current torment. Hopkins also at times employed the infamous method known as the swimming test. Women would be tied up and put into a river or local pond. If she swam or floated, the water was rejecting them and so they must be witches. 
Ordinary people believed in this process, but it was in fact illegal in England, and subjecting someone to this without their permission was considered assault, and if they drowned, it would be a case of manslaughter. So despite the popularity of the swimming test, the more scientific modern methods of examining and watching were preferred. The witches hunted by Hopkins and Stern were mostly poor widows, but not always. They could be unmarried young women, sometimes daughters of widows, and some were despairing young men. One poor young fellow gave himself up at once for examination when Hopkins arrived in his village, telling the witchfinders that his mother and aunt and grandmother had all been executed for witchcraft, and so he was likewise tainted. Another man admitted to bewitching a woman he hated. With women though, the lonely widows especially, their confessions often involved admitting to having sex with the devil in various forms, in the shape of their dead husbands, or as darkly handsome figures with cloven feet and so on, and often rather enjoying it. There's also a focus on their imps, whether in the form of cats, dogs, mice, spiders, snails, beetles, or any other creature, suckling on teats around the genitals, sometimes eliciting pleasure. Time and again, lonely women admitted to turning to the devil to satiate their unfulfilled physical lusts. However, the sexual nature of these confessions in fact reveals to us the preoccupations of the questioners rather than their victims. Hopkins and Stern rode into these communities and stirred up old grievances and suspicions, promising to have them dealt with. Annoying beggars, ugly or unpleasant old women, the deranged, the friendless, or just anyone who was a burden, financially and socially, could be suspected of witchcraft. In effect, Hopkins and Stern were offering, in return for payment, to have the undesirables removed from their community. Hopkins tried always to induce suspects to name accomplices, and so the circle of suspects would grow and grow. But witch-finding was an expensive business, the costs of room and board, stabling and feeding horses, and paying their finders and servants meant that Hopkins and Stern charged these local communities expenses. There's little doubt these men were imbued with a puritanical passion for rooting out the evil within society, and for separating the devil from the souls he had seized. And they must have found their work thrilling and satisfying, but they also discovered there was a decent living to be made. They could create the demand for their services just by arriving in a place, and after starting the prosecution process and being paid, they would move on. The legal process took a long time to complete, and Hopkins would eventually be summoned to court to give evidence against those charged with witchcraft. Those found guilty at trial would be swiftly taken to the gallows and hanged. Most of the women they investigated would never be convicted, their cases dismissed before trial or acquitted after being tried, and they would, in time, return to their communities. Whatever social fallout followed, the witchfinders would never have to deal with it. News of the witch trials and executions at Chelmsford, Bury St Edmunds and Norwich spread to the rest of the kingdom through the publication of pamphlets filled with lurid details. Inspired by these prosecutions, more people throughout Eastern England took up the cause and began their own witch-finding activities. And Hopkins and Stern's witch-finding campaign spread from Essex to Suffolk, into Norfolk, and south perhaps to Faversham in Kent, and west into Huntingdonshire and Bedfordshire. But throughout this campaign, there had always been sceptical men from gentlemen clerks to ministers, unmoved by these accusations of witchcraft, counting it superstition and hysteria, and saw in the accused only ordinary paupers. A minister named John Gall from Huntingdonshire perceived the real culprits when they came into his region in 1646. Gall said, quote, It is strange to tell what superstitious opinions, affections, relations are generally risen amongst us since the witchfinders came into the country. End quote. Gall used his connections, his experience in publishing, and his ministry to campaign against the practices of the witchfinders, who related how old women were condemned merely for keeping pets and tortured by being forced to sit cross legged upon a stool, tied up and watched for 24 hours without food, water, or the chance to relieve themselves. Soon he published a book called Select Cases of Conscience Touching Witches and Witchcrafts. This book soon led to Hopkins' downfall, 
In spring 1647, at a trial Hopkins brought about in Norfolk, local gentlemen, influenced by Gaul's book, drew up a list of questions for the judges to ask of Hopkins. His methods were put under interrogation. Why was Hopkins special? Was his expertise not evidence of his own unholy insight and methods? Were his very ideas and methods not fundamentally flawed? After all, people suffer from all manner of natural growths on their bodies. And did Hopkins use unlawful courses of torture to make them say anything for ease and quiet? Was it true he deprived them of sleep and walked them about until they were exhausted? Did he not immerse them in water, an unlawful assault? The final question by the gentleman of Norfolk cut to the heart of the matter. Could Hopkins deny that all witch finders really did was fleece the country of their money? The line of reasoning was related to the fact that these witch finders had no authority vested in them from the state. The only reason they had been able to operate these last few years was because the state had been preoccupied with the civil war, torn asunder by it in fact. The best magistrates, ministers and judges had been absent fighting the war, or at least were preoccupied by it. Now using the made-up title, the Witchfinder General, Matthew Hopkins ultimately published his self-righteous responses to these questions as the short book titled The Discovery of Witches. By now, summer 1647, he also became increasingly sickly, blaming the unwholesome air of the Fenlands for his malady. Perhaps he had malaria, and perhaps his ill health was made worse by a sense that the tide was turning against him and his witch-finding practices. Either way, he returned home to Manningtree on the orders of his physician and retired to his bed. There he suffered coughing fits, sweats, and intense nightmares. A story spread almost as soon as he died that tells how Matthew Hopkins was subjected by the local gentry to his own swimming test in a pond or river near his home or at the river at Ely, and there drowned. That would have been a fitting end, and one can see why the story was so enduring. Disappointingly, it's more likely he quietly succumbed to his sickness, and on the 12th of August 1647, he was buried at Mistley. He was no older than 27. His partner in witchfinding, John Stern, retired by the end of that same year, crushed by lawsuits filed against him to overturn wrongful accusations and to recover fees. He soon published his own book justifying his actions, but it didn't sell very well. Stern grew increasingly impoverished until before his death he no longer called himself a gentleman but a yeoman. The civil war continued to flare up periodically, and King Charles was executed before the parliamentarians took a firm grip on the country under the rule of Oliver Cromwell. Still, witch trials continued to be held all over the country for years, many inspired by the work of Hopkins and Stern and their books. And even after the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II in 1660, witch finding continued. However, the practice declined in these decades, and the last proper witch trial of this era happened in 1682. While prosecutions waned in England, they began in the English colonies in North America. Some of them, including the famous Salem witch trials in Massachusetts, employed the techniques described in Hopkins' book. The Witchcraft Act 1735 abolished the hunting and execution of witches in Britain. Earlier witchcraft laws assumed witches were real and had real magical powers derived from pacts with Satan. While this new law assumed that there were no real witches, no one had real magical powers, and those claiming such powers were cheaters, extorting money from gullible people. Rationality had won out in Britain over hysteria and persecutions, at least as far as witchcraft was concerned. Despite having records for many of the cases, no one actually knows for sure how many were persecuted in the Hopkins-driven witch craze of 1645 to 1647. Some say about 300 women and men were interrogated, of whom between perhaps 60 and over 100 were put to death. The terrible tragedy can perhaps be seen as part of the brutality and disorder of the English Civil War, which claimed the lives of about 200,000 people. After his death, the mythology around the evil career of Matthew Hopkins continued to grow helped in part by the striking image of his boots, cloak, hat, staff and beard, onto which we can project the sinister beliefs of the 17th century Puritan. <laughs>
In the years since his death, he has been called a vile imposter, a loathsome con man, a human monster, the Napoleon of witchfinding, the hangman of Manning Tree, the foulest of foul parasites, an obscene bird of prey of the tribe of Judas and Cain, and one of the nastiest men in the records of English history. If you enjoyed this story, please hit like, and if you want to see more videos like this in future, please subscribe to the channel. And you can support the channel and get exclusive content and ad-free videos by becoming a channel member or a Patreon supporter. The links to these are in the description. Now, please watch this video on a heroic Englishman, the great sailor, explorer, and privateer, Sir Francis Drake. Thank you for watching.